This is Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. Mike Tirico, Tony Dungy, Mike Florio, just the three of us here to wrap up week 10 of Sunday number 10, I should say, of the NFL season. And why don't we wrap it up with Tony with what's going to be right up there for the play of the year. The Kyler Murray Hail Mary to DeAndre Hopkins, surrounded by three Bills for the game-winning touchdown that has Arizona tied for the lead in the NFC West. Arizona just is a team that doesn't give up. Murray gives them a chance. And uh, DeAndre Hopkins, that just special to go up, the strong hands, hold on to it. But if there's one guy you got to jam and make sure he doesn't make the play, it has to be Hopkins. Buffalo will second-guess how they played that, that final play, I'm sure. Mike? Murray told me after the game he had never connected on a Hail Murray. Uh, Hail Murray. Now I'm using your <laughs> word, Mike. Go a Hail Mary at any level. Uh, I, I owe you a quarter. At any level of football before in his career. They practice it every week on air. They don't go against a real defense. But he said when he let go of it, he was actually facing the sideline. He was looking at his teammates once he let go of the ball as he rolled to the left. He said the moment it left his hand, he knew it had a good chance. He said when a quarterback throws that pass, you just either have a good feeling or you don't. He had a good feeling. It helped that DeAndre Hopkins was on the other end. But what a play by Murray. And, Mike, as you pointed out during the highlights at halftime, that extra little move to shake that guy off who was on him, that really unlocked his ability to get to the sideline and get rid of the ball. And the last time I saw one like that was years ago, San Francisco. They put three guys on one side, Jerry Rice on the back yeah. side, oh, yeah. and threw it back to Jerry Rice single to win a game, Joe Montana. 40 years ago, man. <laughs> you're, you're about right. I'd forgotten about that. And Venmo, that quarter, by the way, Florio to Jake Abrahams, our research <laughs> legend on Football Night in America. He's the one who came up with Hale Murray and, and fed me the line. So, Tony, uh, I want to think about this for a second because DeAndre Hopkins, we've had a little bit of fun with it, but we both were just a little flabbergasted with Houston. I understand salary cap and everything else, but that's the guy you got to keep, especially when you have Deshaun Watson. And moments like that are the reminder. He's a notch above even the best on contested balls in the air. Yeah, uh, and all the big plays that he's made in, in double coverage, in those go-to situations when you've got to have it, you want that one guy that, that they can't cover, and that's Hopkins. So uh, it's paying dividends for Arizona right now. So, Mike, what does this do for Buffalo? I mean, Buffalo was this close to a nice comeback win against a good team on the road. They have a little cushion going into their bye. Now Miami's got a chance to tie them in the AFC East. It's amazing. It changes everything in one fell swoop. In that one moment, the Bills have lost that, that breathing room that they had. Now they have to worry about Miami down the stretch. The Bills hold the initial tiebreaker from their Week 2 meeting where Miami gave them a pretty good game before Miami realized who they really are. And it's going to be, I think, very different when these two teams get together again later this year. Right over here on the Magic Roadmap, Week 17, <laughs> Miami at Buffalo. You know, Steve kornacki has got the big touch screen. I just got a plain old yeah. Excel file here. Uh, that's good. It could end up being for the division. And what about the way, let's just off-ramp here for a second, for the Buffalo side, the reason that they have – no breathing room is the way the Tua Tango Velo has come in and played well for Miami. No, and I think the Dolphins knew that. And Brian Flores, I've talked to him a few times over the course of the last two years. They've had a plan, and they believed in Tua. And when and I was a little questioning it because Ryan Fitzpatrick was playing good ball yeah. when they took him out. But they knew what this young man brings to the table. They've got defense. They've got special teams. And he just gives them a little extra spark and can make those off schedule plays, and they're going to be a, a tough out down the stretch. And, and Mike Florio, we, let's get back to the Cardinals side because now they're tied with Seattle and the Rams in the NFC West at 6-3. and three. And this division looked like Seattle was in complete control a few weeks ago, but the Rams showed me something with their defensive performance on Sunday. It is amazing what the Rams are doing now. They just kind of quietly hang around, and you don't really notice them. They aren't as sexy as they were a couple of years ago when they were the team everybody wanted to talk about. They're just kind of there. And, and, and look, the, the tie is not going to last long because Thursday night, Yep. It's Seattle hosting Arizona, and I asked Murray about that specifically. What are his thoughts on having to do this on a short week? And unlike players who would complain about it, he can't wait. <laughs> These are the moments you live for, he said. They can't wait to get another shot at the Seattle Seahawks, even if it is on a short week. That's going to be a great game, but I really think if you look at these three teams, the Rams probably have the most complete team right now. They can move the ball on the ground. They've got the quick passing game and the movement, and their defense, 
I, I think they have the best defense in that NFC West. So uh, don't sleep on the Rams. And, and that's not something a lot of folks aren't talking about because of Russell Wilson's prodigious start, the great first month of the year that he had. And like Mike said, the Rams flash and dash with Sean McVay was all exciting and all the rage. And Todd Gurley was putting up some huge numbers. But they're doing it with a more complete and balanced team right now. That is not the case with the other teams yep. in the NFC. No, West. They're very, very balanced. And the thing they can do, if they get ahead, they can rush the passer and turn that, yeah. that pass rush loose. So uh, it's going to be an interesting race. Mike, it's hard to believe what we watched with Tampa Bay last Sunday and then what we watched with them this Sunday looked like two very different teams. Yeah, and I asked Ronald Jones about that after the game. What did they do to get past what happened last week? And he said, we watched the film and we threw it away. I don't know how you actually throw it away. It's all digital now. But that's what he said. We threw it away. <laughs> and, and they made an agreement among the players that they were never going to let that happen again, what happened last Sunday night. And when you consider what they went through Saturday night, stuck on the tarmac for hours trying to get to Charlotte for the game. He told me they didn't get there till midnight, went straight to bed, no meetings. It was just kind of a weird thing. He said it felt like a high school game, but they were fine today. They got it going on the ground. That's the key. They need that running game. Bruce Arians was irritated by the number of snaps that Antonio Brown played last week mm. because that meant fewer tight ends on the field, fewer opportunities to run the ball, and as a result, they had a league record low five rushing attempts right. in the entire game last week. In NFL history, can we dig deeper into yeah. those numbers you talked about? Because, Tony, you and Chris Sims talked about that on Football Night in America. The number of two tight end plays that they ran much higher than the prior two weeks, and it showed in how they played. It, it really did. And, you know, you talk about Bruce Arians being irritated. I can see it because I think what happened, hey, we got Antonio Brown. How are we going to use him? Gronk's playing better. How are we going to throw the ball to him? And we've got... You know, Mike Evans, and we've got Godwin. He's coming back off his finger, and we got to get him going. So their whole focus was, we've got all these receivers. How are we going to throw it? And I think they got back to, you know what we do well? We pound the ball, and when we, we do that and we make people defend the run, Tom Brady is going to throw well to all these guys one-on-one, -on -one, but mm -hmm. it, it has to be balanced, and that's what they showed today. Can, can you break down the other number that was up there? It was the number of times Brady was under center. It was over half their snaps when it was a third or even an eighth in the prior two games. Why does that make such a difference? Because now you bring the play-action pass back into it. When he's under center, and that, that's what he does well. You go back to New England and all the quick throws, the timing, the rhythm, and he's going to have that with his receivers. Now you're under center. You force that defense to come in the box, bring the safeties down. Now I've got Mike Evans. I've got uh, Godwin out wide, one-on-one. -on -one. I can win those battles. I've got my tight ends where I can sneak them out. So I, I think everything is going to start off that. They're going to see... Brady is very, very comfortable with that type of game. And, Mike, it, it's so stupid how this league spins. Like You walk away from last Sunday and you go, oh, my gosh, New Orleans just cleaned out Tampa. This is going to go in two different directions. And then one week later, Tampa comes back with this complete effort, and then New Orleans sees their quarterback, Drew Brees, get hurt. And you've been uh, checking in on that. So what do you have on that as we talk about what's going to be ahead for the Saints trying to hold on to the lead in the South? Well, you know, there, there was an element of resignation on Drew Brees' part. It had to kill him to not be able to finish the game. That shows you how bad the injury was. That's what Sean Payton said after the game. The team says it's ribs. Brees says it's an accumulative thing. So, you know, he's been limited in practice the past couple of weeks. It almost reminds me of Peyton Manning his last year where mm -hmm. it was just kind of hold it together as long as you can until you get to a point where you can't play. And maybe it will be Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill. It'll be fascinating to see who they go with if they have a full week to prepare either Winston or Hill. There was a thought this year that Hill would be the number two guy if Breeze got injured, unlike last year when it was Teddy Bridgewater. We'll find out if Breeze ultimately can't play next Sunday against Atlanta. What, what way would you go? I would go with Jameis Winston and keep uh, T Taysom Hill in his role. We're going to have five to ten plays with you at quarterback. You're going to play some other position. You're, gonna, you're one of my best special teams players. That's the thing people forget. If you put him in as a starting quarterback – you lose all of that other stuff. And, and so Jameis played well today. He was under control. He made some good throws. And I think the more he practices, the better he'll be. I would start Jameis and use Taysom as the changeup. We know he's thrown 30 touchdowns in the league as recently as last year. You can fill in the next line. We also know he's throwing 30 picks. You said Winston or Hill, and it reminded me of Winston Hill, former offensive lineman with the New York Jets way back in the uh, 70s. All right, speed round time. Green Bay got the win. Should the Packers be considered 
among the NFC elite contenders, Tony? Well, I think they're among the NFC elite. I just don't know how good the NFC is compared to the AFC. Uh, we heard Aaron Rodgers say we haven't really played a, an outstanding game yet. So I guess that's a glass half empty or half full. We haven't played great, but we're seven and two. Mike? Technically the number one seed right now because they have the tiebreaker over the Saints. As these NFC West teams cannibalize each other, that only boosts the Packers. And if they finally can put a full game together and not sleepwalk through the first half like they're doing at home, they, they could run away with the one seed. And the irony would be they don't have much of a home field advantage this year, but they can have home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Maybe hey, in the weather, that'd be an advantage if you're taking on some teams. I didn't think we'd get into Western cannibalization, but you did, so <laughs> thanks for that, Florio. Are the Giants a sneaky bet to win the NFC East? I don't even know if you could cash the money you would win on that sneaky bet. You'd have to think about that because Philadelphia is not playing great. What was that today? You know, I, I was really surprised at their defense. Um, you, you've got to step up. You've got to shut the Giants down in a game where you could basically lock up the division if you want it. Uh, I don't think I think the Giants are better than Washington. I think they're better than Dallas right now. So uh, are they better than Philadelphia? They beat them today. Mike? Well, and here's what's amazing. This, this is an Andy Reid protege in Doug Peterson. You give him an extra week to get ready, he's supposed to be able to win automatically. To have two weeks to get ready for a team as bad as the Giants and to lose to the Giants, that's alarming from my standpoint. And it makes me wonder whether or not the Giants can just kind of keep, keep moving, just quietly get a win, get a win, get a win. It won't take that many wins to win the division. The combined record of the NFC East, you saw the numbers up there, 10, 26, and 1. The NFC East still has two wins outside the division. The Philly win at San Francisco on Sunday night and the famed watermelon onside kick game with Atlanta and Dallas. And the NFC East has now confirmed, NBC Sports can project, that no team will be over 500 in this division until we get to December. Think about that. And good luck in December. <laughs> Biggest shocker from Sunday was... I think the Bucks going to Carolina and putting up 540 yards and 46 points. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that surprised me. I thought they would win, but I didn't see that type of offensive explosion. Mike? I was shocked the Bengals didn't even show up against the Steelers. I, if, I felt like the Steelers were vulnerable. 8-0, they, they aren't an 8-0 team. Well, they are. Now they're 9-0. But the Bengals had two weeks to get ready. They had confidence. They had swagger. Ben Roethlisberger was gone all week. It didn't matter. Whenever it feels like the Steelers are going to lose, that's when they finally put it all together and blow a team out. I'm going to give you Tiger making a 10 on the 12th hole and then playing the last six holes in the total of 20 after that. That was incredible. That is, that's a shock. Yeah. <laughs> make five birdies the last six holes after you make a 10. Many of us know what it's like to make a 10. <laughs> we don't know that other side. <laughs> almost none of us know how to follow it up like Tiger. Great week in the league. It seems to be every week, and we seem to appreciate it more as things get tougher. Stay safe out there. Back with you next week. Look forward to seeing you on Football Night in America before the Raiders and the Chiefs in the AFC West. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.